So welcome everybody to Sight and Sound Technologies very special evening webinar. We're, uh, we're absolutely delighted to be welcoming Brian Cully from uh, Lineage Cell Therapeutics. We'll uh, be talking about Brian and um, introducing him properly in just a moment. My name is Stuart Lawler. I'm from Sight and Sound Technology and my colleague Glenn Tukey, who's our chief executive, is here with us as well. And uh, Glenn will be speaking in just a second. You're very welcome, as I said, to this uh, ses session that we've been planning for uh, quite a while. And we're very excited to do talk about this because it's always interesting to hear what's happening in the field of research and clinical trials and where, where things might be looking in the future. And uh, we're looking forward to Brian's presentation and indeed to your questions and answers, or rather to your questions uh, um, and to Brian's uh, comments as well. Uh, and speaking of questions, uh, you can get in touch on Zoom this evening by either raising your hand so you can click the raise hand uh, button uh, or you can type in the chat window, which is also available to you during the presentation. And uh, Glenn and myself will be keeping an eye on your comments and questions. And we, there will be um, an opportunity at the end for a Q&A with Brian. Now, before we do anything else, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Glenn Tukey, who's the Chief Exec of Sight and Sound Technology, to say a couple of words. Glenn. Yeah, thank you, Stuart, and uh, welcome, Brian. We're very pleased to have you here with us this evening. Um, I'm the Chief Exec of Sight and Sound, and I've uh, been in this uh, fantastic industry for 13 years. Um, those of you who haven't heard of us at Sight and Sound, we've been going for 42 years now. Um, I have to hasten to add that I haven't been at the helm for all 42 years, although I feel like I've been sometimes for 142 years. We're the leading supplier of technology for blind low vision in the UK. We're best known for that, for sure. Um, many don't know that we're also in the world of uh, literacy and behavioural and a wider range of disabilities as well. And so we're very proud and pleased to be working uh, with probably at any one time 40,000 or so um, people who use technology to uh, help them level up the world. Um, I'm sure Brian's going to tell us how he's going to make us all redundant in coming years, but uh, right now we uh, use that tech and the support and the training we give to, uh, to help people with uh, any form of uh, disability. Um, for those of you in the UK, you can find us in Northampton, Glasgow and the Ed uh, Stewart is in almost sunny uh, Dublin, where we, uh, where we have centres, um, but you can find us operating all over the UK. So we've got about 40 people, we're a $15 million turnover business, so we're well established. And uh, if after this, you feel that you can uh, benefit from any supporting technology, training, or knowledge around some of the technologies that support low vision, then just please do get in touch with us. Um, but before uh, that, um, you can uh, you can uh, hear everything that Brian's got to say because uh, I too am right at the front of the audience, ready to uh, listen to tonight's event. Um, so uh, over to you, Stuart, and uh, to introduce Brian. Uh, thanks very much, Glenn. And uh, just to add to what Glenn uh, said, if you want to know more, you want to have a look at. Uh, what we do, and we're, we're doing lots of stuff, as Glenn has just mentioned, you can see us on the web at sightandsound.co.uk, or of course, we're also available on social media, so you can find us there if you want to keep up to date with what we're doing. Now, Brian Cully is the Chief Executive of Lineage, uh, Lineage and uh, joined in September 2018. Um, he's an experienced public biopharmaceutical uh, CEO, having served in that position with a number of companies. And his broad experiences included the clinical development of pharmaceutical, um, uh, sorry, of um, pharmaceutical products from uh, development through phase three. We're really looking forward to hearing Brian's presentation this evening. It's uh, just gone 10.30 in the morning where Brian is on the west coast of the US. So Brian, thank you very much for joining us and uh, the floor is, is yours. Well, thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Glenn. It's uh, it's really nice to be partnering with you guys on this presentation today. And uh, good evening to uh, all of those who are who are joining from the UK. Um, I'm going to uh, share this slide deck. 
which should be present now for everyone and just move this over here and I'll be ready to go. Uh, so thanks, I'm, I'm gonna uh, spend about uh, about 15 minutes talking about uh, principally about one of our three programs in cell therapy to try to uh, improve outcomes for people suffering with dry AMD. Um, Lineage Cell Therapeutics is a listed company, and so I refer everyone first to our safe harbor clause as I will be making some forward-looking statements. Uh, my uh, background was covered. Uh, you know, this is the third time I've, I've run a biotech company, and uh, I have extensive experience, um, including in, in difficult areas. Uh, I ran one of the largest clinical studies that's ever been done in sickle cell disease. Uh, it was the almost 400 patient clinical trial, and I, I really get tremendous uh, enjoyment out of managing clinical studies and, and trying to develop therapies that, that drive positive clinical outcomes. So an overview of the business before I really dive into our lead program. Um, the way that Lineage Cell Therapeutics operates is that we transplant cells into patients and, and we use what we call off the shelf cells. So we're manufacturing cell types that may be lost uh, by your body due to disease or, or injury or, or accident. Uh, and so we're replacing them. So our approach is really like transplant medicine. Uh, there's a lot of noise and confusion around what cell therapy is. Uh, our form of that is that uh, we manufacture specific cell types. Um, we do control our own manufacturing. We have uh, two uh, facilities where we can um, manufacture clinical trial material. And we have three programs that are currently in the clinic. Uh, we have the, today's topic, which is a program in dry AMD, but we also manufacture a special kind of cell for spinal cord injury, and we manufacture a special uh, immune cell to treat cancer. Uh, and it's been very exciting because we have seen some early evidence which uh, supports our belief that cell therapy can drive uh, successful outcomes in, in areas where traditional approaches haven't been able to provide solutions. Um, we are a, a for-profit uh, you know, drug development or therapeutic development business, and so uh, we are aware that there are um, you know, commercial attributes that are of great interest to our investors, and, and their investments help us move our programs forward. And uh, we have been quite successful recently moving those programs forward, and we, we have uh, announcements coming. And in fact, even uh, this quarter, we have announcements pertaining to data that we've collected in dry AMD. So that's uh, quite exciting. And the company has uh, managed to be well funded throughout this period. And um, you know, it's it's very variable. I think this last point about the the value of the company is a little old. Uh, we've continued to grow and, and make some real progress. And I, I think we're probably now around 400 million US in terms of uh, market value. So now turning to our basic approach, um, we are working to bring forward this, this essentially new branch of medicine where we transplant these cell types into the body. Um, we start with undifferentiated stem cells. So these are, these are incredibly powerful cells for a couple of reasons. One is that undifferentiated stem cells have within them the ability to become any of the cell types in, in the body. They haven't decided what they're gonna to be to grow up, right? Like a small child with a lot of promise might become a police officer or a politician. Um, these undifferentiated stem cells have not yet decided to become liver cells or heart cells. But we know what the information is. We know the, men, uh, the recipe rather to convert them into specific cell types and, and only those cell types. So we have the recipe, if you will, to manufacture retina cells from undifferentiated stem cells. And we do it completely. We never put a stem cell inside of a patient. We only turn those stem cells into retina cells and then we transplant retina cells into the patient. Uh, we don't manipulate the DNA. There are some technologies out there which involve manipulating the DNA, the genome of the of the cells. We don't do that. Um, it's more um, exposure. As I say, it's like a recipe. We sort of coax the cells into becoming retina cells and only retina cells. Um, and we're able to do this from a single vial of cells. Uh, a, a cell line was established more than 20 years ago. And the incredible thing about these undifferentiated stem cells, if you need more of them, you can simply plate them out, um, provide them with the, the nutrients that they need and they'll divide like like many cell types they'll divide and so we have essentially an endless supply of those cells 
And at some point after growing huge numbers of them, we convert them into retina cells and then freeze them down. So we have the ability to, um, through this self-renewing uh, attribute of these cells, we can manufacture tremendous numbers, billions upon billions of retina cells. This is our facility. We have about 30 employees there, many hundreds of patents that are associated with our work and protect our technologies. Uh, and this is a, an, a summary of our three clinical stage programs. And, and the one at top there is the one I'll talk about today, Opergen RPE cells. So Opergen is our uh, code name for it. RPE cells is, is the identifier, the retinal pigment on the epithelial cells uh, to treat dry MD with geographic atrophy. Uh, and one of the notable things about this program is that we have received 16 million uh, US from the Israeli Innovation Authority. This is technology that was first uh, established in Israel and we've since moved it over to the United States. Um, enrollment is complete in this clinical trial. Uh, late last year, we finished enrolling all 24 patients. So the, the patients all had uh, dry AMD with GA. Um, this audience needs no explanation about what dry AMD with GA uh, means uh, on, a, on a very uh, serious level. Um, and so, um, but, but there may be some others who have joined who, who aren't as familiar. So um, this is a, a panel of images that shows the progression of the disease. This is a progressive disease, which only gets worse with time. Uh, and its attribute, primary attribute is the death of specialized retina cells in the back of the eye. And these uh, images here showing an increasing area uh, of the, the black smudge there, that is the area where the cells are dying off. And you can see in this individual, between 2012 and, and 2015, they went from having normal 20-20 vision to being legally blind, a uh, US definition of, of uh, legal blindness, and then continued to deteriorate uh, after a couple more years all the way to 2640. Uh, so this is what happens. This isn't a reversible condition. Things only get worse with time. Uh, it's, it's enormous uh, unmet need. Um, the other form of AMD called wet AMD, uh, there are tremendously successful therapeutics for that condition, but there's nothing yet to treat dry AMD, uh, despite the fact that far more people have the dry form of age-related macular degeneration than people who have the wet form. So there's a huge unmet need and opportunity here. So how do we do it? What's our solution? What do we do at Lineage that's different? Um, well, these cartoons here show uh, how we envision a before and after. So beforehand, um, those orange cells, those are the RPE cells. They are sandwiched between photoreceptors and, and some of the other layers of the retina. Um, and as they become sick and die off uh, and degenerate, uh, waste accumulates. That's called drusen. Uh, that's just the accumulation of, of lipids and fats from the vision cycle. And, and ordinarily, those are cleared by the RPE cells. That's one of their jobs. But when those RPE cells die off, that drusen can accumulate in the eye. And you can just look right in and see it. It's quite, quite easy to find. What we are looking to do is manufacture brand new RPE cells. So now moving to the right here, uh, shaded blue, we have these new RPE cells. We manufactured them, we injected them into the patient. We placed them very carefully into the subretinal space and they are uh, taking over the job of the retina cells that are, that are sick or, or have died off. And in doing so, they're, they're uh, acting to recover uh, or rescue the photoreceptors that are so important to your vision uh, and clearing out that drusen material. So this is what we are trying to accomplish in the patient's eye. The clinical trial had uh, multiple components, but I, I like to break it into two sections. I like to break it into cohorts one through three, and there were 12 people in, the, in, that, in that group. Um, those 12 patients were all legally blind, so they had very severe disease. Um, uh, everyone was worse than 2200, and they were uh, essentially a safety cohort. We didn't expect to be able to, to see a lot of benefit because they had very advanced progressive disease. But then after seeing some encouraging signs, we moved into another group called cohort four. And these individuals had, had better baseline vision. Some of them were as high as 20 slash 65. Um, and this is where we were really looking to see if we could uh, provide some sort of evidence, uh, benefit, or looking for evidence of a benefit in those patients. Um, and this is just a single injection. Um, about 50 to 100 microliters of cells are administered right to the subretinal space in these patients. And we completed the enrollment in this study in November of last year. 
So what have we seen? 24 people since treatment, what have we seen? Uh, well, we're quite excited that no one rejected the cells. There was no acute or even delayed rejection of our cells. They were retained in the eye. And uh, in one case, um, the earliest treated patient has now been out more than five years with this uh, uh, a transplant being engrafted into the eye. Um, the early patients went on to immunosuppressive drugs for as long as a year, but as time has gone by and we've gained experience and comfort with the treatment, we shortened that exposure to immunosuppressive drugs first down to three months, and, and then even more recently, we treated a patient without, um, without any tacrolimus. That's one of the stronger immunosuppressive drugs. The patient's still getting uh, local immunosuppression, but we removed the tacrolimus entirely for a patient to see how they would tolerate it, and we look forward to reporting on how that patient has done uh, uh, soon. And so it's it's been quite encouraging. The fears around rejection of cells have not come to be. We also have seen um, improvements in vision, especially in the cohort four patients that I described. Uh, we've seen a reduction in the growth rate of the atrophy. Uh, and we've seen some interesting things in things like reading speed and the clearance of that Drusen material. But the one thing that stood out more than anything that we we're really excited about is one of our patients actually showed a restoration of their retinal tissue. So I said previously that this area of GA only gets larger. Well, in this one patient, the area of GA actually got smaller. Uh, we first noticed it at nine months and it has been persistently smaller out to our last check, which was 23 months. Uh, and the patient also uh, has benefited with improved vision. So this was quite extraordinary because human beings lack the ability to regenerate retinal tissue. Um, if you uh, suffer a cut on your skin, your body has the information, the programming to be able to re repair that tissue, but you don't have that that uh, capability in your eye. So this is the first known report of retinal tissue restoration in a human being. Uh, and it's very exciting. And, and we think that um, being able to reproduce this, if we, if we are able to reproduce this and demonstrate that it, that it um, has, can happen again, uh, is, is really incredibly promising and what may be uh, ultimately one of the more notable findings to ever occur in the field of dry AMD research. So this is a look at how those 12 patients in cohort four have uh, performed with respect to their visual acuity. So these are, these are values off of an ETDRS eye chart. Uh, and what you can see is the treated eye, which is shown in the green line uh, over time, those treated eyes are doing better than the orange lines. The orange lines is the untreated eye. And you can see that uh, on average, patients are doing uh, seeing about 10 letters more with their treated eye. Uh, now, these are somewhat small numbers. You can see at the top of the figure where it says n equals 7 and n equals 5, um, that's the number of patients. Uh, but, but now those numbers are n equals 12. So we, uh, we intend to report this quarter on how the data have uh, evolved since we last reported it in November. So there's an update that people will be able to look forward to to see if we're continuing to see these sorts of improvements in visual acuity. Uh, this is again an audience that, that needs no explanation, but uh, one of our standard explanatory slides is showing what 10 or 15 letters of improvement might look like to an individual who's reading an eye chart. And so this is moving from the, um, the, the, the letter K in the gray circle. How does 10 or 15 letters of improvement look? Uh, it, it's it's uh, quite notable. You, it's not subtle. This, this is an improvement for these individuals. And we have had individuals who have had uh, 20 or even more letters at some of their recorded time points. So those are, those are fairly significant improvements in their visual acuity. Another important metric in the patient population is the growth of their geographic atrophy or GA over time. And in this slide, same, same patients, uh, same time frame, but you see that the curves are now inverted. The orange or untreated eye is now above the green line. And that's because the area of atrophy in the untreated eye is growing more rapidly than the treated eye. Uh, so this is what we would expect. We want the lines to be inverted compared to vision where you wanna see an improvement. Here you wanna see a reduction. So we're quite happy to see this. Um, the lines, the, the collection of data and geographic atrophy takes longer, it's slower because these are slow growing areas of atrophy. So it can take a year or so to be able to detect differences, but we are encouraged that we do seem to see some separation of the curves. And we hope that as we go from five, six, four patients to 
8, 9, 12 patients that these lines will further separate. This is a bit of a complicated slide, but this is what I was talking about before with the retinal restoration. Uh, the color coding here is uh, is time, and the images are essentially aerial photos of an area of atrophy. So back in May of 2017, um, colored in orange, we essentially traced the area of atrophy. So this isn't, let's think of it as like an aerial map of the atrophy. And you can see it changing from orange to red. It has grown going from orange to red over the course of about a year. Uh, so we confirmed that this patient had a rapidly growing area of atrophy. And then at red baseline, that's where they received a treatment. And then we looked again at month nine, and that's colored in blue. And you can see now in the center panel, that the blue area is smaller than the red area. And, and that was the extraordinary finding where we had a reduction in the area of atrophy. Um, that continued at looking at month 15 in green. You can't even see it. It's entirely covered. Uh, and then all the way out to month 23 in yellow. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't wait to month 24. We had to, had to look early. So we looked at month 23 and continued to see that this patient's area of atrophy was still smaller than it was recorded at baseline. So that is really extraordinary. Um, and again, this patient has also benefited from an improvement in visual acuity. Now, we, we of course asked the question, why did this happen? How, what was different about this patient? And we think that the answer is that this patient received uh, more aggressive uh, 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 coverage of their area of atrophy. The cells were pushed further across the area of atrophy, so they got more complete coverage. And we think that that led to this benefit. And so after we saw and understood this, we actually told our surgeons to, to please be more aggressive, to please try and reproduce this. And so we have now a number of patients uh, that, that we are hopeful will be able to show that this phenomenon can be repeated and it is the result of some surgical technique and not, not something exclusive to this patient. I, I don't actually know of any reason why this patient would have been um, genetically different uh, we think it was more of a procedural difference, and we, we hope to be able to demonstrate that later this year. Uh, there are many, many comes, um, you know, we, we, we do often present uh, not just the science, but, you know, a, an investment perspective. And so there are many companies that are working in this area, although I would say that it's actually quite a small number compared to the commercial opportunity. Um, but most of those companies are focused on complement. They're, they're interested in, in how the inflammatory uh, role that, uh, that, that is involved with the death of these retina cells. And so a number of companies are looking at, at ways that they could reduce inflammation or, or affect inflammation cascades. Um, the cell therapy companies, they're, they're not a large number of us. They're, they're really just a handful, which is curious to us because only cell therapy has the ability to uh, restore tissue with infrequent dosing. Uh, we, we all are aware of, of uh, therapies that require an injection in the eye every month or every other month. Um, cell therapy proposes at the worst to be delivered every couple of years and potentially just a one-time one -time treatment for your entire life. So, uh, so cell therapy to us is a modality that, that has some real advantages. Uh, within cell therapy, only lineage has ever shown this phenomenon of retinal restoration. And we're also the only company that has access to a, uh, a delivery device uh, that was uh, established by a company called Gyroscope. It's quite, a, quite an interesting way of delivering the cells. The, on the left here is a traditional way of delivering cells. You, you actually uh, push the needle into the eye, you remove the vitreous and, uh, and insert the needle below the retina. Um, so far, so good. Uh, you can deliver your cells, you can deliver your material beneath the retina. But then when you remove the needle, a lot of that material can flow out of the hole that you made, and that can lead to adverse events and complications, and it, and it doesn't give you control over your dose. So uh, this relationship that we have with gyroscope gives us access to a device in which the needle comes around the outside of the eye and up underneath the retina, and in doing so, you never puncture the retina. So you have better dose control and you avoid the adverse events that are associated with cells leaking out of that hole. So um, this has been an exciting uh, new way that we've tried to improve not just uh, the cells, but how we deliver those cells. Uh, assuming that we have some success um, and that this is something that many, many people are going to want to have access to, we've worked very hard on our manufacturing. Um, we, we make about 99% pure RPE cells. 
Um, we do extensive analytics to make sure that they are functionally active and that they are the correct type of cells. And again, we don't genetically modify these cells. We just expand them and, and uh, instruct them to become retina cells. Uh, we also have a thaw and inject formulation. So the surgeon is able to thaw these cells just a, a, a few minutes before administering them. Uh, and it, it, the surgery itself only takes about 30 minutes. So it's not unlike a glaucoma surgery. The patient's awake um, and, and there's a small incision performed in the, uh, in the sclera. The needle is slid down and around. And um, in, in most cases, in less than a half of an hour, the patient is, is up and, and leaving uh, with their, their new uh, transplant. Uh, and we've been able to scale our manufacturing tremendously uh, in a container about the size of a, of a milk jug. Uh, we're able to manufacture 5 billion RPE cells, which gives us thousands of clinical doses. So um, the commercial or the cost implications of being able to manufacture thousands and thousands of clinical doses from a single cell line, it's always the same cell line. It'll be the same cell line for 30 years. Um, being able to manufacture you know, uh, upwards, you know, in, in innumerable amounts of, of material from our process uh, provides us with some real advantages. So Operagen is, I think, really well positioned to disrupt what's been going on in the dry AMD uh, market. There are some regulatory advantages, there are some commercial advantages, but more important than all of that are what we see are the clinical advantages. Uh, we think that the single use, uh, the potential to restore tissue, um, the benefits uh, that we that we are trying to um, uh, ensure can occur uh, in connection with the changes in visual acuity. Um, all of these really give us a lot of excitement about what we're seeing, uh, and uh, and we we sort of are unique. It's it's a different approach, but I think that uh, it's quite compelling. And you know, I hope that some of the questions that we get are, are going to allow us to talk more about how we view this uh, being used in the future. I did want to say, um, without talking about the other programs, I do want to say for the Operagen program, we do have additional data that we will announce this quarter, and then again next quarter. Um, and this is from those patients in, in uh, October, November. There's six patients that we haven't reported yet. So they're going to have at least three months of follow-up uh, that will report this quarter, and then at least six months of follow-up that will report at the next quarter. Um, and, and these are a, a cohort of patients that uh, came to us following uh, the COVID slowdown. It was really hard to enroll patients for a few months, but we got it all here in the fall, um, and it's really exciting. And, and from here, we're going to want to go talk to FDA about next steps. So Lineage uh, is, is really a different cell therapy company. Um, we have three clinical stage programs. We control our own manufacturing. We have hundreds and hundreds of patents related to cell therapy. Uh, the company is well funded and, and we're a growing leader in regenerative medicine. Uh, but most importantly here at the bottom of the slide, um, we're really working hard to see what we can do about helping the millions suffering with dry AMD be able to um, you know, slow their disease, perhaps stop the disease, or even, it is hoped, reverse the disease. So with that, I will um, stop sharing the slides and uh, invite us to head into a, a Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. A really fascinating presentation and really interesting just to get a glimpse of what's going on right now. And I guess more excitingly, what might happen in the future. Really, really great and powerful presentation. Thank you very much. I'm going to go across to Glenn to have a, a look at some of the comments that have been coming in on the chat during the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, I've got a couple actually, uh, not necessarily wholly related to the center of what you've been talking about, but uh, around the edges maybe. In October, Lineage uh, received a patent extending the op regen cells to other eye diseases. How soon until some of those applications end up in clinical trials and how soon would other eye cells other than RPE cells, rods, cones, get into the clinic? Yeah, that's a that's a very nice question. So um, I really don't think of this as a treatment for dry AMD with GA. Um, this is a an RPE replacement therapy. So I don't think we should be limited to a certain definition of disease. Uh, there are other diseases for which replacing the RPE could be beneficial. So um, 
uh, Stargardt certainly comes to mind. Uh, Vitelliform maculopathy comes to mind. Like there are other places where we might be able to en enjoy some sort of benefit. Uh, for the immediate term, we're focusing on dry AMD. There's certainly enough people out there that um, you know it's a, it's a fine place to start. But I think that longer term, in connection with a life cycle management strategy, we would definitely be interested in seeing where else the transplant of RPE cells could be beneficial. And, and you know, perhaps in other uh, disease settings, you may be able to see better results or, uh, you know, it's, it's really unknowable. It depends on um, the causal reasons for the disease. But if replacing RPE with, um, you know, fresh, vigorous RPE cells is, is potentially helpful, I think we'd ultimately want to look, about, look at going into those areas. Okay, uh, thank you for that. The, the other question, uh, same uh, questioner actually, was interested in your, your team and said you'd had some recent exec changes uh, and had you replaced your CFO. Um, uh, so that's an interesting left field one for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to answer it. No, um, uh, yeah, Ms. Roberts was our chief financial officer. She helped us tremendously with, um, with, with some of the um, sort of rebranding and new priorities that we had in place for a couple of years. Uh, she had an opportunity that was sort of a, a can't say no. So uh, we are actually, you know, between CFOs right now. I'm, I'm filling the dual role, which, uh, which is okay. Um, but we, uh, we have have a, a, an open position. So we are going to be hiring a new CFO. So that position will be filled. So um, yeah, that's just professional evolution. It happens at all levels. So, um, you know, not not anything that I think people need to worry about. Cool. Well, back to back to the day job. Uh, what sort of cost per patient uh, does your, your, your therapy uh, incur? Where, where are you with that? Yeah, so the, the, the important thing to keep in mind, um, there's a distinction between um, the, the terms autologous and allogeneic. So um, what we do, allogeneic, is really off the shelf. So I, I talked about the manufacturing scale. And when you can produce huge numbers of cells and produce large numbers of uh, treatment courses from a single batch, that allows you to be very competitive on price. There are some other technologies in the eye and elsewhere where um, companies or, or academics are starting with the patient's own cells and then manipulating and then putting them back in. One of the challenges there is that that is a very personalized treatment. So, so you're basically building a therapy for one person. So I don't know how the economics of that really work out. How can you really, how can you have a profitable business if you are essentially making a personal medicine? Now it works in cancer because in cancer in some many places you can charge 300, 400, $500,000. But that's not realistic in the eye. Um, you know, therapies in the eye might be, you know, four digit, five digit therapies, low five digit therapies would be more pragmatic and, and, and acceptable to the payer community. And so I think when companies like ours are working on their therapies, they are thinking about how they're going to be able to fit into a world where the, the, the um, payments for these therapies are, you know, despite how long it may last, um, they're far more realistic in light of the overall value proposition and, and not some of these crazy six figure charges that, that you hear about in other disease settings. So we don't price the therapy today. We, we absolutely won't. And, and uh, you know, until and unless it's approved, that's a very, you know, uh, downstream question. But what I can say is that by using allogeneic cell lines and enhancing our, our manufacturing production, it means that each specific vial of cells that would go to a patient is going to be very cost effective. So um, I, I hope that's enough of an answer without actually providing specific pricing information because we don't have it today. Good one, like it. So um, you mentioned competitors, uh, Sana Biotech and Notch, uh, new companies on the horizon. Um, you know, where do you fit in against them and where do they play in your marketplace? Yeah, that's a broader question about um, allogeneic cell therapy more broadly. Um, 
you know, there, there's, there's a, to use a, a gambling or poker reference, and, and hopefully people get it, there's, there's a buy-in to sit at the cell therapy table. And, and when people are thinking about lineage and other companies, uh, what I would say is that the, that the buy-in to sit at the cell therapy table is that you, you should be in the clinic. You know, if you're, if you're real, how do you assess if a company is really doing well? You should be in the clinic. You should have human data, not animal data. You should be able to manufacture your material in an economic way. I mean, it's one thing to say you can make material for a you know, small number of people in a phase one study, but you know, do you have a clear path to providing a commercial and affordable commercial solution? You know, those, those are real questions that I don't know if every, every company can answer. Um, one has to think about the, um, uh, the safety um, you know, I don't know. I think it's very unclear at this point how some of the gene editing technologies are going to play out. There have been some notable um, issues in certain places. Um, they may be company specific, they may be technology specific, but if you want to have a seat at the table in cell therapy and, and you know, be, be, you know, really credible, you have to be able to make your cells effectively, efficiently, reproducibly, you have to be able to deliver them well, and you have to be able to show people a clear path that you have a commercial product. And that, that's been sort of the DNA of our company is, is working that way. So I don't know every detail about, you know, the notches and the Santas and the, and the Blue Rocks and the Semas and everything. Um, each, is, each is a little different in, in what they're emphasizing, but I can say quite proudly that, that Lineage has worked very hard to help mature this field and be able to demonstrate things like, you know, fears about rejection of cells just haven't been unfounded to date, at least with our technology. So I'm quite encouraged with respect to where we stand against and, and among all of those other companies that, uh, that some of which are, are, are getting quite a lot of notoriety and, and you know, they, they still have, a, I don't envy them. They still have years to go before they're sort of having multiple clinical programs like we are. So I'm, I'm excited about where we're positioned and I think we have a lot of upside as well. Excellent. Front of the pack with a home, uh, more of a home question here. Um, uh, can you expand on the one patient that resulted in retinal restoration that was not necessarily genetics versus surgical procedures? Yeah, so it, it's, it's always difficult when you have an N of one, right? Because the immediate question is, well, why was that patient different? So um, we can't say because we have not been able to go back in time and you know treat that patient in different ways and, and you know kind of do that experiment. So you have to start making assumptions. So one of the things that we know is different about that patient was that they got essentially complete coverage. So it, when, when you're thinking about an area of atrophy, you know, you want to be very careful when you're delivering the cells. You don't want to disrupt the macula. You don't want to end up with a patient being worse off them they went in, right? So it, it, it's it's tricky to get your cells delivered fully across an area of atrophy. Now, this patient in particular had, as you, as you saw in the pictures, had sort of like these lobes or domains with their area of GA, um, it was multi, multi-focal. So it may be that that area of atrophy, it was easier to kind of lift it or separate it from the underlying uh, membrane. And in doing so, we were able to get almost complete coverage of our cells across the area of GA. Now, if you go and compare that with a patient that's got, say, you know, a 14 millimeter square GA, it's really hard to get total coverage. You, you've got very little to work with there. But if you have these little pockets and islands, you might be able to, to get very nice coverage. So we think of it, we assume right now, until proven otherwise, that that patient had an extraordinary result because they got such comprehensive uh, exposure to our cells across the whole area of GA. Um, it is much easier to ascribe their outcome to the process than it is to think that they had something genetic because our cells are indiscriminate about the reason why someone has GA. So if you think of it this way, um, the analogy here is, is my car. I need to get in my car and go somewhere, but it won't, it won't take me there. Why? Well, maybe the tires are all flat. Maybe the engine's missing. Maybe it's out of gas. Maybe I don't have the key. There's a million reasons why I might not be able to get from A to B. 
And all these other approaches are trying to say, oh, well, I, I supply tires, or I supply gas, or I supply an engine. We supply a new car, <laughs> right? So I don't really care the reason why somebody has dry AMD with GA. Which pathway is broken doesn't matter to us because we're providing new cells. So we think that we cover everything. So that's why we feel that the genetic profile of that individual is unlikely to explain why they had such an extraordinary outcome. Uh, you know, applying Occam's razor, it's far more likely that they did well because they got very aggressive treatment. And we're hoping to demonstrate that right now because we went back to the investigators and said, in the patients that are treated in your in your in your clinic going forward we would like to have you be more aggressive, push those cells, really work hard to get those cells across the GA. And we also were looking for patients that had smaller areas of GA or, or more of this island profile rather than a big giant circle. In doing so, we think that increases the probability that we'll be able to demonstrate that it was not a single phenomenon, that it's actually something that's reproducible. And, and ultimately, where we want to go is we want people to be diagnosed early. And, and you can imagine that we've gone from these huge areas of GA to smaller and smaller. I want to get to the point where somebody's having impaired vision, they go to the doctor, they get referred to a specialist, they're diagnosed with dry MD, they've got early stage GA, there's a little spot in there, and we go in and we drop our cells in there and that's it. They're good for the rest of their lives. That is where I think this technology is ultimately headed. Wow, well, that's uh, uh, interesting because it sort of it is quite neatly positions the next question, which is, well, could the infrequency of the treatment be a factor why fewer companies are looking at cell therapy, less product needed, therefore less profit? You know, if, you're, if you uh, cure them with one shot, then... Uh, they're never going to come back. Um, I, so I don't think so. And that's because there are so many people that have dry AMD. So, so it, it, there's, there's sort of like this almost like, you know, criticism or reputation that pharmaceutical companies don't want cures because it's not profitable. I, I've never in, in 30 years met anyone who really has that view, but I've met innumerable people who want to do good before you know their day is over so i i think that very it, you know if that were the case then there would be no gene therapy companies but we have huge uh influx of capital pouring into gene therapy companies over the last few years and those are companies that are trying to cure people um you know bubble boy syndrome sickle cell disease i mean it's it's a it's a one-time treatment um, but yet those companies are backed by very serious investors. So I don't think it is the case. I have a different view. I think the reason why we don't have a lot of companies working in dry AMD is because it's really difficult. It is difficult to use a small molecule or an antibody to treat a condition for which the hallmark is the death of the cell. So in, in some cases you've got you know, one thing broken in a, in a cellular pathway. And you can go in there and you can um, increase signaling or decrease signaling with a small molecule. You can block receptors and things like that. But when the cell has gotten to the point that it is, that it is uh, dying, there are so many things that have gone wrong to that cell. I find it difficult to believe that you can use a single molecule to affect a single or a few pathways and have that turn into a clinical outcome when the disease condition is is so far uh, advanced. So, you know, I think that those small molecules or antibodies, may, maybe if they're used super early and, and constantly, I think that would be more likely to show up in a clinical trial. But, uh, you know, we've, we've had a number of companies, we've had some very large failures in the space. And I think it's because it just doesn't fit with much of the pharmaceutical armamentarium and that we need new approaches. And in this case, the, the transplant approach is, I think, where it's going to where it's going to fit. I, I I feel the same with our spinal cord program. I, I, just to go to the side for a moment, there are molecules that can help grow axons, but axons that don't wire together and fire at the same time don't work very well. But using whole cells, implanting whole cells, and providing the insulation and the and the connectivity. You know, that's another place where I think that cell therapy is far more likely to be successful compared to traditional approaches, many of which have failed. Okay. Um, 
As your plots had large standard deviations, did some people respond better than others? If so, what differentiates between them? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, not everyone. I, you know, when I first joined the company about two and a half years ago, I, I thought it was curious that there was sort of this reputation that cell therapy was going to work 100% of the time and 100% of the people. Um, and maybe that's just there was so much excitement and there has been so much excitement in the field. But the reality is there, there's very few therapies out there that work in essentially everyone. Um, Personally, I don't get much benefit from aspirin, which is weird, but it's probably got to do with my genetic makeup. Um, so I, I think that the it is unsurprising that we have both outliers um, in terms of benefit and, and not everyone is responding. Um, that doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, but I also think that this is a new technology that has not just the cellular component, but also the delivery component. And like any new technology, there will be improvements over time. The cells will get better, the delivery will get better, the patient selection will get better. And I think what we will see over time is an increase in the benefits. So something like as simple as LASIK surgery, when LASIK first came out, people were scared to do it. It sounded kind of daunting. Now, you know, I, I don't know that people really think twice. They're happy to go, you know, have that kind of procedure done. So I definitely think that with an early technology where you're still kind of, you know, fumbling around trying to figure out how best to deploy it and in whom and when, uh, that definitely gives us a lot of opportunity for improvement. Uh, but I can also mention for that person asking the question that we have previously provided patient level data. So if you go back to some of our earlier, I, I showed summaries today, but if you go back to some of our earlier presentations uh, that are all filed publicly, you, you can actually see individual lines with patients. And so you can see someone who's gotten you know, 24 letters of improvement at four and a half months. And you can see someone who had you know, one letter of improvement, which is basically meaningless. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely variability, but over time, as we add more data, we will start to get a clearer picture of what the percent response really looks like. And I, and I think it'll improve over time for the reasons that I, that I just stated. Paul, uh, are there plans to treat the other eye of the participants? Uh, eventually, <laughs> yes. Um, so we won't be doing any sort of crossover in this study. Um, it would not surprise me. I, you know, talking to a woman just uh, a couple of weeks ago who has had a, a really wonderful outcome. She called it life-changing. Um, would she like her other eye to be treated? I'm sure she would. <laughs> but um, in the context of ethical management of clinical studies, there won't be any crossovers in these patients. Um, the next study that we do will much more likely have uh, a cohort of patients that are not treated and are compared with the ones that are treated so that we can really get a, a clear picture of what the magnitude of benefit looks like in an average patient. Okay, will your phase three trials move to earlier treatments? Um, I, I think we will have, an, so I, I can't know until we sit with FDA and have a conversation about it, but I think that we will have enough safety data that the agency will be comfortable permitting us to go even earlier in um, in our patient characteristics. So right now we have inclusion criteria with our clinical trial that select for a certain uh, minimum size of, of atrophy and, and certain um, level of vision. You have to have a certain level of impairment before you would be eligible for one of our clinical trials. Um, I would hope that as we go forward into later stage trials, that we would be able to loosen those criteria somewhat on the on the, on the good end, on the earlier stage end, um, because that would help us get more patients on study. We get more evidence to to you know inform us uh, going forward, and uh, and that would allow us to enroll faster. And and I frankly think that that's where it's where where, the, where the, this is headed is to earlier stage treatment. Um, as I as I described previously, I, I want to nip this thing in the bud before it before it gets to the point where you you've got um, you know a, a sixteen millimeter GA in the back of your eye. Mm -hmm. Outside of AMD and stem cell, you mentioned other cells to treat disease. Can the same process lead to other treatments? What comes to mind? Uh, are there partners you think of? Yeah. So. Um, 
I'm a big believer that that cell therapy is is going to eventually deliver on many of the promises that it that it offered 10 or 15 years ago. But I think cell therapy was a little too ambitious. People were talking about you know, a decade more ago, talking about curing Parkinson's and, and autism and, and all of these very ambitious things. Um, we, we almost as an industry forgot to get some some wins, you know, get some points on the board. And so I like that we are working in the eye and the spinal cord. Um, I like what we're doing in cancer. I think that, I mean, there, there have been a lot of successes in cell therapy and cancer. So I think that um, the answer is that Yes, we we have some places like the eye and the spinal cord, which I think are great places to to start longer term for lineage and for others. Yeah, I think there's some other opportunities that, that people would like to go into. I, I know companies that have recently filed INDs, which will allow them to go into the clinic, um, I believe this month, in areas like Parkinson's and uh, and and other um you know, important and notable conditions. So there's an evolution. Um, would I like lineage to to capitalize on that, expand what we're doing? Absolutely. Do I do I want to be the Amazon of cell therapy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we the cells that we use can become anything. So we just need the instructions and we need the the, the capital and, and we could go into other areas. And you know, obviously we keep a punch list of ideas and, and we actually have data in some other ideas that we, that we don't necessarily talk about publicly. But um, yeah, I think ultimately there, this, as I talk about ushering in a new branch of medicine, there's going to be a whole field of medicine around cell therapy based on where it works better than other approaches. And it won't go away, it'll, it'll become routine. And, and that's part of the life cycle of a technology. No, so actually like that. How do you examine or determine rejection within the eye and what does that look like? <laughs> I guess my joke answer is I, I don't know what it looks like because we haven't had it. Um, I, I think there are some uh, I, th I think there are some some um, some things that we would be able to um, rely on that would that would make us suspicious about whether someone was rejecting their cells. Um, but again, we haven't seen that. I mean, the beautiful thing about the eye is, you know, it's 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 a it's a window, right? You just look right in. So we can um, put a scope up and we can look in and and you know, the P in RPE cells stands for pigment. So we can look and see that our pigmented cells are sitting there right where we deposit them. And the, the imaging technologies are quite remarkable nowadays. So we actually see the the, the bleb, which, which is where the cells get delivered. We see it become formed. We watch our material get administered to the eye. Um, we check on this patients uh, regularly. Their physician checks on them regularly and is able to see how that uh, transplant is is doing. And the anatomy of the eye doesn't change. You're, you're always looking in the same place. You just follow the, the vessels. You can see exactly what you need to see and where you need to go. And so if I don't have this particular set of slides in our in our deck today, but if I were to show you the durability, the, the five year durability of, of a treatment, you, you would essentially be looking at the same image, like nothing has changed over five years. So um, so it's it's fun. I mean, I, I kind of joke that I don't know what rejection looks like, but um, I, I think, you know, whether through direct observation or, um, you know, hallmarks of, of rejection in the in the body, we, we would be able to detect it if it if it were occurring. Um, but thankfully, it, it hasn't yet. This uh, This last question here is one that I had actually, I, should, I would have asked if you hadn't, because how do you direct the cannula to the required area of the cell level of the retina? You know, how do you get that around the edge? That's uh... Yeah, yeah, um, well, I sure don't do it. Uh, this, you gotta have steady hands. So so the retinal surgeons, um, you know, they're very they're very good at working in sort of mirror images. So so there's a there's a video I could I could share Glenn and direct people to a link if they want to follow up. And it's it's actually really cool to watch. I've watched a couple of live surgeries and it's it's just remarkable. Um, but to to describe it, you know, in basic terms, um, the sclera, the white the white portion of your eye, um, there's an incision made right into the sclera, and um, and this very thin cannula. Um, let's, let's just call it a pipe cleaner. It's it's a lot more flexible than that, but um, you just slide it into that incision, and there's essentially a separation of the of the tissues just under the sclera. You're able to kind of glide along. 
around the back of the eye, um, you know, sort of like, you know, sliding along inside of a globe. And as you advance the cannula forward from outside of the patient's eye, it is um, navigating its path underneath the retina. And you can actually see the end of this flexible cannula as you're looking in the front of the eye. So the camera is positioned in front of the eye and you can actually see it begin to enter the field of vision, the, the, the vision of the, of the surgeon. Mm -hmm. And you can see it enter the field of vision. And then you, there's a, a step under which you extend a micro needle from the end of the cannula. And that micro needle has, a, has a, just a, you know, the perfect angle to be able to come up and uh, be positioned just below the retina. And then uh, a, a little bit of uh, what's called buffer is administered to establish the space. And then there's a changeover of the line and the cells are then administered into that space. And then you remove the needle and it just comes out. And then a couple of sutures are, are placed right there on the sclera. Uh, and the feedback that we've had from the surgeons who have performed this has been, has been wonderful. They really like it. Uh, I think they think it's neat, right? It's a new toy for them. Uh, they do have to be trained on it. It's about a half day of training. They 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 work on um, animal eyes and, and a cadaver eye, and and they're able to be um, you know ready to go. It's 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 actually sort of natural for them. And so it's been uh, it's been wonderful to see you know this new device. It only just got approved, I think, about a year and a half ago for use um, to be able to see it. We've we've now used it in our hands seven times, and in all seven cases, cells were successfully delivered. So you know. You know, batting a thousand at this point. Yeah, with a very high degree of uh, you know probability that it's going to going to work. It's absolutely fascinating, actually. Um, that's reached the end of my little list of questions, Stuart. I've run out of things to talk about. That's okay, Glenn. We had one more that came in via email uh, today um, from somebody in Spain, actually, which I had shared with Brian. Um, and can patients treat their disease with operogen? Um, I'm not exactly sure if that's referring to or what sort of treatment that's referring to, but that came in earlier today. Um, there, there was a question that you had shared. Someone had, uh, had asked about um, other inherited retinal diseases. Mm -hmm. And if, that, is that, if that's the same question, um, I, I partly answered it already. It, it, you know, I think the answer is yes. So Stargardt's, for example, would be a, a, you know, a, a juvenile retinal disease. Um, there's a cone, cone and rod disease. So I, I think anything for which the hallmark is the loss of RPE cells could fit into a potential therapeutic opportunity for our operogen treatment. So, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't think of this. Uh, right now, we're testing it narrowly in dry AMD with GA. Um, but I think longer term, there's, uh, there's a broader application for the replacement of RPE cells. And, you know, there may be other places where these cells have functions that, that could be beneficial to patients. And I look forward to being able to explore those as well. Very good. I uh, just had a quick check and there's nobody with hands raised in the audience. So I take it, Glenn, that that's all our questions from your end as well. Yes, it is, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for, for a fascinating presentation and some really thorough uh, answers to our questions. It's been really interesting, just as I said earlier, to get a glimpse into just what's going on and to get an understanding of where we're going with this really groundbreaking uh, research and work. So thank you for taking the time to join us today for a really great session. We definitely hope to stay in touch. And to everybody who's come along this evening, I hope you have um, I hope you've gotten as much out of it as we have. I know Glenn and I have found it very interesting. And, and when we spoke to Brian originally before Christmas, we were very, um, we, we were really, uh, I suppose, um, interested to share all this stuff with as, as wide an audience as we could. So thank you very much. Uh, that's it from us. Thanks for joining us and stay safe and stay well. And Brian, again, thank you sincerely. Yeah, Absolutely, thank my you. pleasure. Thank Brian. you. David Mann says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he, he was asking <laughs> you lots of questions as well. So I think you have to hit lots the of thank yous. there. Brilliant. And then plenty of thank yous come in. Uh, we've all enjoyed it, Brian. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on with us tonight. I've Thanks. enjoyed it. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you.